Hello there. Going through a divorce? Considering one? Sorry to hear that. But here you are. Welcome to Splitsville. You'll find Splitsville to be a pretty unique place. A new world, really. With its own rules, its own expectations, and in many ways, its own language. But don't worry. You have a knowledgeable guide along the way. A family law attorney with three decades of experience under her belt. And now, here she is. Your host and guide, Lee Sellers. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Welcome to Splitsville. I'm your host and guide, Lee Sellers, founder of Touchstone Family Law. Today, we're here with Clark Walton, and we're going to be discussing computer forensics or how we can protect ourselves from invasions of privacy in the world of divorce. Well, today we are talking to Clark Walton, who is a forensic guru, is my my description of him, but I'm going to let you hear it directly from him. So Clark, why don't you tell our listeners what it is that you do? Sure. Thank you for having me here. So I am by background an attorney, but also a computer guy. I've got a a background in computer science and forensics, digital forensics is a way that I found to sort of marry the two things together. We, again, being a lawyer, seeing that side of it and seeing the technical side, we advise clients on a number of issues ranging from how best to preserve. If you've got electronic stuff, text messages, computer, internet history, a thumb drive, anything like that. We advise clients on how best to preserve those things. We also do a fair amount of investigation. So if you're not sure about you know, whether a certain thing exists or you think it does, but you don't have it in hand, we will work with clients to actually do the investigation, pull out that data, and, and hopefully someday present it in court if it needs to be. Now, with your digital forensic team, who are your typical clients? Are they companies, lawyers, individuals? Uh, anytime. So that that's a, brings up a great point because at the beginning of any engagement, we feel most comfortable working through attorneys, but we don't always work through attorneys. So we the typical case would be an attorney would call us because we've got longstanding relationships with those attorneys and we engage in a matter through the attorneys. And it could be a family law case. It could be more of a corporate case where someone has left a company and taken things with them and we're trying to figure out what they took. But we always ask, are you an attorney or are you working with an attorney? Because at the very outset of a case, the way that you structure that may affect whether we may be compelled to testify about those things later. So we always say, are you working with an attorney? If the answer is yes, we are most comfortable at least working with the knowledge of that attorney as to what we're doing because we're creating a record We're talking to an individual about potentially sensitive things and learning sensitive things. And we want to make sure that is is legally protected if it if it needs to be. Now, to be clear, this is not like a genius bar sort of thing. This is not we don't come to you when someone's accidentally lost all of their photographs or their master's thesis is missing. I mean, typically, this isn't just troubleshooting some sort of an isolated data problem. Generally, if people are going to come and work with you, it's because they're looking for something kind of systemic or pretty broad. Most of the time, that's the case. Although as devices get more complicated, the brand new Mac that you would buy at the Apple store right now doesn't have a traditional sort of spinning hard drive in it. It takes some expertise to even recover data off of that. So we are doing, still doing some just straight data recovery where there's no legal matter involved. But I frankly expect we'll see more of that as time goes on just because of the complexity of these devices versus the way they were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, when you're talking about devices, explain what is a device that you would be working on? So doing digital forensic work will work on really anything that will hold digital media, digital evidence, anything that contains sort of ones and zeros that turns into a picture, a Word document, a text message. We have some level of capacity to work on those. And if we don't, we can either tell you who does or we can tell you, you know, don't waste your time and money. This is really what you're trying to do is really not going to be helpful um, in terms of recovery. So it could be a computer. It could be a cell phone. 
uh, either a, what we call a dumb phone, you know, a flip phone or a iPhone, Samsung, smartphone, that kind of thing, an external hard drive. It could be cloud-based evidence. We're seeing more and more. We're pulling Apple backups out of the cloud. We're pulling down, uh, if you're familiar with a tool called Carbonite, people mm-hmm. use to back up their files. Dropbox, Google Drive, a long list of those things that we're pulling. And we're mostly pulling the same things that consumers could pull themselves. But we kind of know what to look for in addition to that to, depending on the case, potentially prove some some very helpful things. Well, in our line of work with the um, strictly divorce law, family law, most of the devices that I see that either my clients are interested in looking at or I'm interested <laughs> in looking at are the, the handhelds, the mm-hmm. smartphones, the tablets, home computers, laptops. Mm-hmm. But actually... You guys can deal with probably GPSs in possibly even in cars and you know, the old Tom Toms, if anybody still use those, but navigation systems, really anything that's storing. That's right. We will look at, we've been requested to look at Android watches. We did have a case involving a Garmin recently. You know, Garmin will, they've got the traditional GPS device, but they've also got that embedded in, in watches now. Mm-hmm. And so you could have Garmin watch syncing to the data app on your phone and it's still holding similar data to what the old gps traditional gps devices would would do and so we do see some oddball things come in we have looked at a couple of xboxes for instance you know Mm -hmm. gaming systems that kind of thing where people are chatting across those those services and things like that yeah it's getting to be more and more pervasive as these devices are I guess getting more and more embedded in our lives. I know that the it's interesting that you mentioned the Xbox and and the um, the gaming systems and consoles because I am finding that that is a better and better and better place to look for communications. Not just you know I think people traditionally think we're only looking for evidence of um, some sort of infidelity or mm-hmm. or bad behavior between spouses, but parents communicating with their children right on those devices or children communicating with other children but a lot of information about what's going on with the the children of some of my clients or you know somebody who's really working to manipulate the situation by staying off of those more traditional platforms yeah you know we're our, our probably most frequent requ- request is to pull deleted text messages off of devices but kids aren't they're using text messaging, but they're not as much using text messaging anymore. Many kids are using Snapchat, so their parents have to get Snapchat to communicate with them sometimes. The Xboxes, any other social media platform, Twitter has a mess, you know, direct message capability, Facebook message capability. And so when an attorney or a client comes to us and says, grab these messages, we've got to be clear about what those messages are and where they sit. You may think they're on the phone, but they're not on the phone. They're stored in the cloud, or maybe they're in either place. Maybe they've just been deleted and we can't get them back. So it is important to be in tune with sort of what everyone is using now, because text messages are, are easy to grab back off of those devices that you mentioned, but it may not be text messages. So sometimes we'll do a great amount of work and the client may be disappointed if they haven't sort of clearly communicated what we're looking for. Now, there's two things that are important to to note here. You're a professional in both respects. So you're clearly a digital tech specialist, but you're also, as you said, an attorney. Yes. Um, So you have that kind of perfect mesh of knowing not just how to get data, but you have an understanding about whether or not you should be getting that data. Right. I don't know about perfect, but I, I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, th- there are some things that if a person brings us a device, you know, that is one thing that helps us on the front end when we say, do you have an attorney? Can we talk to that attorney? Because we want to get a better understanding of, you know, if you bring a, a phone to us and it is not your phone, if it is a stolen device, if it's something like that, and we start to work on it, we could potentially incur liability ourselves. And so Mm -hmm. that is our sort of first line of protection is working with the attorney of the person. But beyond that, yeah, if just an individual comes off the street with a device and says, will you work with this? I'm not working with the other attorney. There are some things we look for, some things we have to think about because there are some certain laws out there that we and, and listeners should be aware of. At the federal level, no matter what state you're in, one is called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. 
which creates civil and potential criminal liability for me if I'm accessing a, a computer that's not mine in layman's terms. So that's one thing to be aware of. And that goes for me as the examiner as well as the person who's bringing me that device. If we're accessing it with what's called without authorization, then then we've got a problem there. The second is called the Stored Communications Act, which prohibits us from accessing things, not necessarily on a device, but things we don't own that are in the cloud or at what's called a communications facility. And and that's a maybe a fancy word for like a Gmail a Yahoo, a Dropbox, anything that we've got to go online and access, we typically need signed consent to do that and some level of comfort that this person has the authority to do that. And that might mean they've got the password to it, they've accessed it before and can tell us what's in there, you know, it's their email address associated with it, that that type of thing. And so occasionally we will, someone will come to us with a device and we'll ask those questions and not like the answers and we just won't won't do the work. And I think that that, as as a domestic attorney, is one of the things that is getting to be more and more, more problematic. Because if I'm simply trying to assist my client reclaim information off their own devices because they just don't remember where it is or they can't easily find it or they know that they've they've told, you know, they've communicated with this person in a good fashion – they have all of those permissions and access. So sending them to you and saying, hey, I would like for you to help them pull every communication that they've had with this human, you know, within this this time range and all of these mediums, that's a more direct process for us because we are claiming things that our own client just maybe doesn't know how to get or can't get it in a format that's as usable. But what we find is the problems where we've got people coming in and their interest is in getting information off of a spouse's device or someone else that they're in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And they are directly trying to either come in and say, I have already hacked this (laughs) device and this information, or please help me get to what's on my spouse's phone or the father or mother of my child's phone. And what's really frightening is how much stuff is on the market out there that people can find and and download. Right. Yeah, there are a lot of what are called spyware apps out there. When you start thinking in terms of, which is when you hear the term spyware, you should probably have your, you know, this might be illegal antennas up. There are a number of those products marketed more towards monitoring your children. Most of the major carriers give some level of monitoring. You know, I can tell where my my child is by using GPS or when they get a text message, that type of thing. There are some others out there. Uh, One I have helped clients use in the past is called TeenSafe to help them monitor their children. One of the nice things about TeenSafe, if you're using it correctly, is it is, you know, for purposes of monitoring the child. And if you're using an iPhone, it actually doesn't, as long as you know the child's credentials, their iPhone username, password, it actually doesn't leave anything on the phone. So they may or may not know that that there's even anything there. You run into problems more on Android because of the sort of larger application market there and things that people can download to to monitor those devices. Generally, we, we do get that question a lot. I think I'm being monitored. We get the question less, I want to monitor someone else because again, the, the illegal antennas start to sort of go up. But when someone says, I think I'm being monitored, there are some basic sort of steps we walk through with them to figure that out. Most people I've found, in this country at least, use iPhones. Uh, there is a subset that uses Android. But if you have an iPhone, the nice thing about iPhone, as long as you're not a criminal, is it's really secure. You know, you've got a passcode. Nobody's going to break that passcode outside of um, law enforcement at this point. But the not so nice thing about Apple is it leaves data, if you configure it incorrectly, virtually everywhere. So you've got an iPhone, but then also you've got an iPad. And maybe you back up to your computer and you've got iTunes. And maybe you have your chat synced to your Mac. So you've got the chats and texts going to your computer. And then you back up to iCloud. And so when we have seen evidence of monitoring by someone else, particularly with the Apple devices, it's not so much there's spyware on my device. That's an easy thing for us to tell. If you've got spyware on your iPhone, that phone is most likely what's called jailbroken. You should look for an app called Cydia, C-Y-D-I-A. It will be there on the phone. 
it requires somebody to actually have that phone in their hand to do the jailbreaking. So if a spouse has never had your phone, if that's a brand new phone you got out of the, you know, out of the box and have started using, the likelihood that that phone itself has spyware on it is very minimal, very minimal. However, if you and your spouse had a joint Apple ID and he or she knows the password, that doesn't really matter, right? Because if I'm backing up to iCloud, I can download the contents of their phone to a new phone to someone like me who can give you a full report of everything that is or, or may have been on there. Deleted text messages will carry across iCloud. Or that's iCloud, then you've got iTunes, where if I can find a backup of your phone on your computer, I can perform the same type of analysis on it, or your iPad, or maybe you have synced across those devices and the kids or the spouse is using the iPad and starts getting your secret text messages on it. That's where we see, I don't call it so much spying as it is sort of data leakage. It's, it's sitting, things sitting in other places you don't intend them to sit. So it's really important to sort of configure your, your profile in that way correctly. There are ways to do it where it's really secure. More often than not, though, people don't do that, and there's data just sort of sitting everywhere. The whole Apple platform that I guess designed for for ease across all of these devices, we are finding that as more and more people let their children have their old phone or their old iPad, you know, a hand me down, we really are finding a lot more trouble with messages that weren't intended to be viewed by the entire family suddenly popping up on an iPad, you know, while somebody is watching The Lion King. Right. And, and it is very pro- problematic. So what would you suggest to people if you're going through a divorce and separation and you really would like the sanctity of your communications um, to remain intact? Because I, I get concerned about it just because I don't want my communications with my client to be read right. by, you know, the, the other spouse or, or anyone else in their family. So I'm worried about my confidentiality so that so it's not even anybody doing anything wrong. It's just you should feel safe that your communications are only being read by the people that that should have access to them. So what are some tips for people when you're kind of breaking apart from those family clouds and family services? I would say first, and we're focusing on Apple because that's what most people Mm -hmm. seem to have, but go to iCloud.com, log in with your Apple ID and password. A lot of people as a starting point don't remember their iCloud password, but make sure you know that and have that comfortable. Log in and it will tell you in the settings what devices are connected to that Apple ID? What's receiving those text messages? If you see devices that shouldn't be on there, that's a flag right away that someone may be monitoring you in more or less real time because they're receiving those those uh, messages. When you determine you want to sunset one of those devices, take it off the account, give it to the kids, give it to you know, trade it in for a new one. That's a really common one. I was looking at my phone because what you can do is just go to settings. There is a place in settings under general where you scroll to the very bottom, go to reset your device, and you want to just erase all content and settings. On an iPhone, that is at this point the most secure way to, I I do that every time I trade a phone in, the most secure way to get rid of that information. Your iPhone is by default encrypted, which means if I don't have the encryption key, I can't read your stuff. The encryption key usually being your passcode. If I don't have that, and you know, I go to reset. Say, so I, I do have to have it to reset it, but I go in, reset it. That stuff may still be there on some level in the background, but even for a forensic specialist like me, it is functionally gone. So, number one, if you're going to give your device to your your child or someone else, and you're concerned about that, start from a clean slate, reset the device, then set that child up on or someone else on a different Apple ID. Don't log back in with your same ID because then you're just going to create the problem again that you just tried to fix. So have a clean separation there as well with when you stopped using the device versus when the child or someone else started using the device. Keeping in mind that if you are in a legal situation, the act of resetting that device without properly preserving it may be an issue. You need to consult your attorney before you do that. Now, if you are... And I've noticed that this has become a bit of an issue, too. So it used to be with families, 
figuring out who would provide the cell service for the for the children mm-hmm. was like a perk. You know, if if one parent paid for the cell plan, that was like great. You know, you just kept them on your plan. It was inexpensive and it was a service to both parents. But what we're finding is it's not so much of a perk anymore. It can be kind of intrusive. So you hate to have everybody have separate expensive phone plans, but the parent who is paying for the plan and has the access and has set it up with their Apple ID and there is is not just figuring out where the child is. If the child's of a certain age, they're figuring out where the parent is right. oftentimes. And so we're now finding that these phones that are given to children, sometimes for a very innocent purpose of just being able to communicate with your child, FaceTime with them, have direct communication without having to go through the other parent, are actually being used to monitor those other parents. So there's really... Now, is there anything you can do if your child has a plan and and you it's not on your plan to make sure that you can prevent those settings from intruding into your life? Yeah, on on your phone there are a couple things you can do and I would recommend this just generally. One is on many types of phones, most frequently iPhones, there is a default setting where your GPS coordinates are being captured with every picture that you take. And those pictures don't carry over if you post it to Facebook or Twitter or something because they scrub for that information. But if I text it to my child, that information does go with that. And so I could be telling the child, the other spouse, my location at that certain point in time, which I may or may not want to have happen. So there are a couple settings like that on my personal device that I would, would say be mindful of those and enable. But also, you know, I have had cases recently where... A child's phone is, at least to a, a judge in the jurisdictions I work in, sort of open to both parents. And if you take one into court with saying, I want to look at the other, you know, at the kid's phone, or I want to look at this container on the kid's phone, because it's not just about the phones anymore. Kids are smart and have encrypted, you know, passcode protected containers. There's a fake calculator app where you can store pictures. Snapchat has a section called, I think it's for my eyes only, Mm -hmm. where if I don't know the passcode, even if I have the phone, I'm not getting into that. And so I have seen that recently where even if you think, you know, you're having these protected side communications, anything you text to anyone else generally, and especially your child, may wind up in somebody else's hands. And so just being mindful of that fact is probably the most important thing. But there are, again, those technical settings that a couple things in the background you just want to be mindful of. What are some of the best security settings that you can suggest to people if they really want to protect their privacy? I've heard a lot of people say, you just need to go in there and turn this location finding service just off. Location settings can be a good thing. It can also be a horrible thing. You know, if you're not wanting someone to see where you are and and Text, basically texting your GPS coordinates, but it can also be very helpful. So when you are installing an application, just think for just a moment. I mean, we all do this, right? We want to sign up for a credit card. We get the credit card. We throw away the big thick booklet that comes with the credit card without reading any of those things. But when you get that application, just be sort of mindful of what you are agreeing to, what that application does. Facebook wants access to your photos. You're going to click yes because you're trying to post a photo or something like that. But, you know, remember that you just gave Facebook access to your photos. So remembering those things, going into your settings and seeing, you know, what have I given my location access? Which apps have I given my location access to? Which apps have I given my camera access to? Those types, that type of review is helpful. As an example, I went as kids and we went to buy a minivan So I installed a CarMax app on my phone. I inadvertently gave CarMax access to my location data. So when I go to image my own phone and look at that, I see, oh, geez, I've given CarMax my location data. Why did I do that? Well, I did it because I wanted to know which CarMax I was close to. But in the long run, after you bought the minivan, you probably, CarMax doesn't need to know where I am uh, type of thing. So just being mindful of those types of things, stepping back from phone application data, probably the most helpful thing you can do with most of the online accounts you have is enable what's called two-factor authentication. Most people know two-factor because you have it with your banks and your credit cards. When I go to log in to my bank, I get a text message saying, is this really you? If it is, enter this code. 
So the one factor is me knowing my password. The other factor is that I have my phone in my hand. You can do that now with your Apple ID. So anytime someone is trying to log into your Apple ID, you'll get a text message. You can do that with your Gmail account. And these are all free services. You don't have to pay anything else to, to get this. And most email accounts now are, are, if they haven't offered it already, they're starting to roll it out, even if it's a free service. That two-factor is probably number one. Because not only does it protect your privacy, but if someone attempts to get into that, you are notified more or less in real time of that, of that happening. There are applications out there also if you're on a, you know, number one is probably just basic what we call computer hygiene, you know, not logging onto Wi-Fi in uh, Starbucks, for example, without a password. Any Wi-Fi that doesn't have a password associated with it is not necessarily encrypted between you and the internet. And so someone else could be seeing that data. So logging into Wi-Fi with a password not logging into strange computers. You know, don't go sit at the public library and log into your Gmail account kind of thing. Because even though it says it's going to scrub it later, it may or may not. Protecting your your passwords just like you would your wallet, your keys, and everything else. Trying to think what else. There's really just so much out there. There are so many different apps you can download and use that are collecting so many types of information. It's really hard to put sort of one, one thing on it. There are three sort of rules of the road we typically recommend to people. One is if you didn't go looking for it, don't install it. So when you go to a website and it says, you know, install the latest version of this, you need this, you may need that, but go to that software website and do it the legitimate way. Don't just click on a box that you see online because you may be enabling things like spyware. The second one is if you're not going to use something, get rid of it. There's no need for me to continue to have CarMax on my phone after I've bought the car because I'm still giving it my location information. So just delete the app. Otherwise, it's just one more thing I have to keep up to date, which leads to that third point, sort of rule of the road. If you are going to use it, keep it up to date. The nicest thing about iPhones is they've got that automatic update feature where if somebody has compromised your phone at some point, you've enabled that auto update the next update rolls out and to some extent that may be fixed and you didn't have to do anything other than just let those updates sort of happen. Same thing with your computer. The latest version of the Apple Mac operating system is really secure. They're really giving us headaches as forensic examiners. The older ones are are great when they come in because we can get lots of data off of them, whereas now we're not, not quite as much. Now, we've talked a lot about the Apple products and I admit when people come into my office, I see more of those too. Mm -hmm. I do occasionally run into the Androids and, of course, the Dell computers or ThinkPads or or just Mm -hmm. other PCs that often people have for work. But let's talk a little bit about what the the proper – the steps that you go through to collect or or have data. So I think we've already been trying to make sure that listeners know don't download things on devices that you don't own – trying to, to to get information off of it. That's not the proper way to do it. You can get in trouble. There's mm-hmm. criminal penalties, civil penalties, and it's just going to turn out badly for you. And we know as attorneys, if you bring us that stuff, we can't look at it anyway. Right. We can't use it. Or we get in trouble too. But, but there is a way to do it. And so it's sort of a trust the process lecture. So if you want that, there is a legal way to go request it and get the data. And I know you guys often, with permission, mm-hmm. be a court order or a discovery order or a protective order, are allowed to go in there. So talk a little bit about what it is that you do when you properly get somebody's device and you have the opportunity to go through it and preserve the data. Thanks. Yeah. And so in in our cases, 98% of our cases are civil cases, which means we're either working with someone's consent to looking at information, or if it's the other side and we don't have consent, somebody has gone and gotten a court order to give us that consent to, to do the work. So we will take a device, if it's a, a mobile device, Android, iPhone, iPad, the first thing we try to do is shield it from the computer network or the, the internet, the Wi-Fi, whatever it's on generally. And just We just throw it in airplane mode. That way we're not getting interference from are we pulling down cloud data or not? Or 
is somebody trying to remotely wipe or do something to the device that just sort of alleviates all those issues is the gps turned on you know we don't have to worry about that so sticking with the phones we use a tool called celebrate it is a fairly expensive tool it's the same thing that the fbi the local police would use if they were looking at a phone and we can do one of several different types of downloads that way We would then process that data. The most frequent request is for deleted data if we're in sort of investigation mode, or we may just be in preservation mode. You as an attorney have recognized a legal obligation for us to hold this stuff, whatever that stuff is, so we are properly preserving it in the event that the phone is damaged or something even the following day. So we produce that information to you. You You review it. We have done this in a way that we could later testify about it and we could swear out affidavits or come testify in court, that type of, of thing. With a phone, you're going to make minimal changes to it just by the by turning it on, by walking around with it. A phone feels very personal. We put it in our pocket and our purse, but all it's doing when it's turned on is talking to the rest of the world. And so we try to at least minimize those changes. With computers, computers... External hard drives, thumb drives, is a little bit different. We take what are called full forensic images of those drives. So it's not just like copying files, copying folders. We try not to log into computers with all we act- at all. We actually remove the hard drives and take a perfect image of that drive. Because, and this is, you know, if you're attempting sort of self-help and you want to go do investigation yourself, just the act of logging into that computer might be an issue. It's changing dates of when somebody logged in and and things like that. And so if you're concerned about when someone was last using an application or what they were doing last time they were logged in, just by logging in, you possibly are changing that information. And so we try to minimize that and just take a perfect image of it as we receive it. Then we do the work. Whether people get their devices back, it varies by attorney preference. I don't know what your practice is, but in in a lot of civil cases, we will return the devices after we've imaged them. Some prefer that we hold them until the case is over with, but a lot of times we do wind up returning them just because iPhones, Macs, and so forth are are expensive. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what makes it hard for people to just go out and replace them. It used to be easy enough for people to to go get a new phone when you were going through a separation or divorce, we would say, well, you know what, just to be on the safe side, get this, get a new one, turn this one off, you know, lock it up. But these days that's just really getting cost prohibitive for, for most people. But the cost actually of you guys doing um, the forensic work to go pull data off or image them, the software may be expensive for you guys to purchase and, and it's not easy for us to use, but your costs are not exorbitant in my opinion to do it yeah i mean the all all devices are a little bit different if you're just talking about preserving a hard drive just holding an image of that drive is going to run three four hundred dollars depending on the size if you're talking about preserving and imaging a cell phone there are twenty thousand different configurations of cell phones out there more often than not that's going to run somewhere in the six to eight hundred dollar range to to preserve that and on our end, that typically would include some type of reporting to you. But that, that's right. I mean, you're, you're generally talking in the hundreds for the preservation aspect. When you start talking about really complex forensic investigations, looking at, we have a, a Mac here in the studio, I see that looks like a reasonably new one. Forensics on that would probably run in the several thousand dollar range pretty quickly um, just because of what it is. But when we think about these things, this is where we sort of ask people to look at the big picture and not be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. Generally speaking, if we're even looking into this, we're talking about assets or communications or things that are important about the case that are hundreds of thousands or more Mm -hmm. of importance to the families. We don't we don't just as a rule go in and copy every phone. So it's not always relevant information, but if it's deemed relevant, it's relevant for a reason. So when you're paying a thousand or under to preserve evidence Mm -hmm. um, that could be important when you're litigating something worth much much more it just doesn't make sense to to be trying to do it yourself yeah uh, yeah. and play with it yeah i think that's right there are some tools out there that will allow folks to do some level of this on their own there are a couple issues with that one is what we call sort of the chain of custody that how that evidence got from your phone to the courtroom 
if if you are the party and you've got an interest in the outcome of this and you're the only one who's handled that information, that could be called into question by a court. If you're not an expert in handling that type of digital evidence generally, it's a there's a decent likelihood you may do it incorrectly. Or worse yet, you know, you, you download a program, you think it's the right one, you've actually downloaded a virus and you've corrupted your, your computer and, you know, sort of spoiled that process as well. So, you know, there is benefit to using us. It's not always necessary, as you said. But, you know, in those cases where it has been contested, we are comfortable going to court, you know, swearing out affidavits and so forth. And if we're asked really complicated questions about, you know, why did the phone retain this data but delete this other data and, you know, did your client do it or not, we have pretty comfortable answers to those questions as to what we did and what maybe what the client did. Now, we've talked a little bit about restoring data. Most people are not really aware of how difficult it is to really delete something. I mean, you see, you know, I think CSI and some of these forensic criminal shows have maybe given people an idea that you can go back and find things people think they've deleted, but it's really all still there in the most time, most of the time, isn't it? It's on some level, yes. Whether I can get to it is a different question. At some point, it's like when you factory reset an iPhone. But at least for some period of time, most data after you delete it, if you're talking about files or text messages or internet history or something, is still there. There are factors to consider when you're talking about the likelihood of getting that data back. So I'll never guarantee to a client you're going to get back the text message that was sent January 1st at 12 p.m. I will tell a client, you know, this is an iPhone 7 running iOS whatever. There's a pretty good likelihood we frequently get back deleted data of these types. The call logs, the text messages, the Apple notes, the calendar entries, sometimes the internet history, one or two deleted pictures, possibly, those, those types of things. So, the factors weighing there are how long it's been since that information was deleted. Your phone, your computer likes to reuse memory when it's empty. And so if that data is later, if that space is later reused, the file's totally overwritten, that's when it's gone, gone. Uh, there's not a way for me to grab it back once it's what's called overwritten. If it's just deleted and still hanging out somewhere, that's where you've got a decent likelihood of getting it back. And um, I think most people probably have more memory than they need these days on their devices. That's probably right. The iPhones are, I think I've seen the advertisements for the you know 500 gig, one, one terabyte Androids that are supposedly coming down the line. Even the iPhones now, I mean, it's pretty standard to see a 256 gig iPhone, which if you're talking about text messages, text messages are tiny. Most people are filling up their phones with either applications they're downloading movies, they're saving videos, they're saving pictures. That's where the memory sort of comes in. Well, and with the Apple devices, at least, you know, a lot of it is staying in the clouds and you're only accessing it. I mean, I know personally, it seems like I've downloaded a song 10 times and at some point it still disappears and I have to read right, right. it again yeah. to the device. Yeah. So they seem to be drawing things off of, of the device. Yeah. And that's more common with media, the videos, mm -hmm. uh, movies, you know, anything you purchase on iTunes, uh, pictures, the real user data that somebody like me or in a legal case you'd be concerned about is generally going to sit on the device that the call records, internet surfing, text messaging, those types of things. So outside of the devices, what are the, the, type of technology that you think or that you would suggest that li listeners be the most careful about protecting? Be careful of, this is not anything computer science-y, this is just more common sense, but be careful about what you're putting on social media. We are requested to download a lot of social media accounts. Sometimes it's the public-facing information. Sometimes it's the private side. If we've got a username and password, um, we can download that with the right authority. And so, Sometimes it's not, you know, us doing anything really super secret or, or sophisticated. It's just doing a diligent investigation of somebody's online profile and, and figuring out about information that they've been posting. Perhaps they've been posting, they think, anonymously. 
but you've got enough of a footprint there where you, if you know kind of who you're looking at, you can see two profiles sort of tracking each other and develop an opinion that, yeah, this is probably the same person based on them posting the same pictures and that types of things, those types of things. So just being conscious of what you're doing with social media, it can be a really fun thing to use done well. Uh, it can be a really great legal tool if, if not done well. So that that's probably number one. Number two would be, you mentioned you're, you're getting a lot of mobile devices. It's just being aware of where your information is going that's on that mobile device. As I said earlier, Apple will store information in the cloud and on your phone and on your iPad and on your computer and on iTunes. And it's really all the same information. It's just stored in three or four different places. We get a lot of cases where it may be an employer-employee case, and we will image the employee's computer, and we'll find out about the affair they've been having because they've left a full backup of their iPhone on their work computer and probably don't even realize it. And so just being mindful of sort of what you're plugging your devices into or what you're logging on to where is helpful. We've recovered personal Skype communications on a work computer before, that type of thing. So it may not just be the, the spouse one place or the other. You know, we, we have seen in, in domestic cases, you know, a company, one of the employers will get subpoenaed for that type of information. And that's one thing I think that is important to remember the uh, to remind the Lesters about. I know in our office we say, look, we will not communicate with you on a work email address mm -hmm. because it's not protected. Your work email address belongs to your employer, right. not to you. And therefore, we can be considered to have waived any privilege to that communication. So when they try to get us to use the work address, which they do to try to make sure – that if they don't feel secure about their home addresses, they feel more secure about the work one. It's real difficult when you, you say, no, you know, I cannot email you at your CMS yeah. um, address Or get a, get a new email account. You know, mm -hmm. Gmail's free. Just get a new Gmail account just for the purpose of, of this legal action and talk to you on that. You know, that's. Yeah. And the extra the extra steps that it takes in a domestic case really is as much about. I don't know, trying to hide things so much, but just being aware of what you're disclosing. There's right. a certain amount of openness right. that you're going to be required to have anyway. Right. But when you're not, it, it's important. What are some of the scariest software that you've seen out there that as a tech person, you're just like, oh, my stars? Well, the spyware apps, certainly, that you can find mostly on the Android devices and then it's or the Android market, rather. And then if you can jailbreak an iPhone and the way it'll usually work is Apple will roll out an update. And then some hacker somewhere will figure out how to get around that. And you can do what's called jailbreak the device. Once you jailbreak the iPhone, there are lots of other things you can do with it that I wouldn't recommend anybody really do. Kids do it because then they can download other, you know, sort of illegal, not illegal, but not Apple approved apps, games, and so forth. But that, for Apple devices, that's probably the, the scary thing I'd be aware of are those types of, of apps. Certainly all sorts of malware, all the things you read about in the news, we, we pick up those types of things when we look at people's computers, trying to think. There's there's one app uh, or one program in particular called CCleaner, C-C-L-E-A-N-E-R. It's free. You can download it off the internet. It wipes a lot of information that I consider helpful as a forensic person. It'll get rid of an unallocated area on your, you know, the wipe clean a, a lot of things on your computer. It, that's good from a privacy perspective, but be mindful of that also. I talked about this obligation to preserve evidence, particularly if you're already in or thinking about a legal proceeding. We have used, when I see that being used in a case, particularly by the other side, we use it kind of on its flip side and use it as a weapon against the other side to say, they downloaded this. I can prove they downloaded this after this case started. They should have known to preserve that. And then you get what's called the adverse inference, right? That if, if we can't find it, it must be bad for them. And, and that's usually a killer in court. Oh, it is because then they just they have wide opportunity to believe anything bad that the other side accuses you right. of because right. it's like, oh, well, had you not wiped it, that that's what it was, yeah. even if that's not what it was. Right. Exactly. Um, you don't yeah. know what it was. Yeah. yeah. It never works to try to be sneaky with court. Talk a little bit about spoofing. Some of the apps out there that let you to the outside world appear to be other people or dialing from other numbers and this sort of whole world of creating 
kind of false realities. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, most people who have a cell phone now, you'll get the junk calls from, I mean, I get them from Russia and wherever else, you know, a couple times a week, if not per day. Uh, so with what's called voice over IP, you know, using the internet to make phone calls instead of the traditional phone lines, you can make like make it look like you're coming from other places. We've seen a couple of cases like that. Some of the really prevalent apps that were doing that have been shut down. But it's still certainly possible. And so when we see someone accused of that, it's helpful to get as much information as possible. It's also probably not going to be proven unless you sort of work it backwards with the final sort of person who received its phone records. You go to the provider and say, give me the underlying sort of call data so we can track back who that number's you know, associated with and really figure out potentially what app or service was even being used to make this phone call or send this text message or, or that kind of thing. It's like we talked about earlier, text message is kind of a subjective thing. It may look like you're receiving a text message, but it may have originated from some other type of, of service. And so tracking that backwards is really tough. We've had a couple cases where it has been done and know that it is possible. It's not difficult for someone who knows what they're doing to go online and figure out how to how to do that. So we do see those come through occasionally, and they are really hard to, to prove, particularly if you don't know who's doing it. Well, and we've seen situations where people will create, well, as celebrities see it all the time, but, you know, even in, in divorce cases where people will create a fake profile or Instagram account or Facebook or some social media account, mm-hmm. ascribing it to their ex-spouse and then post really horrible, damaging comments making it look like it came from my client here right. it's not their page but you know it really takes some somebody coming in and looking and, and proving no that's that's not that this person did not set it up it was set up in another ip address but you can post people will they can you know where the pictures are saying oh yeah you're you're tweeting from here you can actually select where you want to say that tweet came from when right. you're, you're in the app but right. um if you don't really have somebody looking behind the, the curtain sometimes people will come in with some damaging information at trial and it's not actually legit right yeah that's right and it, it's hard to to show that sometimes we do it's one of those things too where things that are really good from a privacy perspective can be used in a bad way and they're really damaging you know i've got a browser on my computer uh, it's called Epic Privacy Browser. It's got its own what's called a VPN on it, virtual private network, where I can select where it looks like I'm coming from in the browser. So whereas if I were just using my regular Internet Explorer or whatever, it, I, it looks like it's coming from my home. If I use this other tool, I can make it look like I'm coming from Eastern Europe if I want to and create a profile and and so forth on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And that would be really difficult law enforcement maybe would have some capacity to track that back. On the civil side, you're going to have a very difficult uphill battle figuring out who did that, ever tracking it back to the to the spouse type of thing. And we see this more in domestic violence cases or, or those types of a really, really, really high conflict custody cases where somebody would go to such extreme measures is not like a everyday occurrence. But certainly that technology is out there. It is. It's pretty scary. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, it's probably more of an everyday occurrence for us because that's what we that's deal with. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's uh, it does happen and it's easy for people to do. And, and this, this generation of, we talked about sort of what the younger generations are doing now relative to the older generations. I spoke at a university last week and the students were spot on with the things that I was telling them about. You know, a lot of the topics we've covered here today, just sort of from a different perspective. And these kids are very savvy about these things as they go get married, have children, potentially get divorced, that kind of thing. I can only imagine sort of what the next wave of this is going to look like. Yeah, it's getting getting harder and harder. Right. And they're they're aware. Yeah, it used to be you could be one step ahead of your kids, but now it's getting to be harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. But a lot of these programs that they're selling out there that they say are for for child safety. It's like you said, they're, they're these are getting put on non teenage phones. Yeah, prob- most likely. Yeah, yeah, and increasing and increasing amounts um, with that idea. Right. They, that's what they get the software for, but they don't just put it on that phone. So that's right. I think it's important for everybody to maintain some 
ownership of their technology. I find in a lot of households it's one person who does it. Um, yeah, whoever more pays so than the bills, the other. right. Or just whoever's more interested in it, you know, it's like, so I always tell clients, like, you need to know what all your passwords are and, and you need to know how your internet is set up at your house and what yeah. the passwords are. You can't just leave that with one person, but. Yeah. I mean, we will occasionally get a request to, you know, I think there's a listening device in my house kind mm-hmm. of thing. And then you probably had that request too. And that's sort of one, there's one type of person, the private investigator that with certain equipment that does that. But then people forget to maybe my ex still knows my Wi-Fi password and I've got my alarm system and thermostats and refrig- now refrigerators, right, and, and everything else connected through that Wi-Fi, my home computers, phones. So securing that information is just as important as if you're going to change the locks on your house, it is just as important to change your Wi-Fi password and and you know, other types of information that's sitting out there in the cloud that's sort of similar to that. Let's talk about those horrible cameras that everybody's putting in their house. Like IP cameras? Yes. Yeah. I can't stand those things. Everybody <laughs> is watching their babies sleep all the time. Right. Um, and every room in the house seems to be being monitored. Yeah. But we've got the ring, the, the cameras, you know, at the doors. Yep. Those are a treasure trove of information. Yeah. We haven't had a case where we've been asked to look at one yet, but uh, yeah, I imagine they would keep pretty good logs. It's turned into, I mean, really just this sort of internet of things, all the different types of things that you can get information from. And, and most of that stuff syncs back to those mobile devices. Right, because we there's about. an app and, and you can check it all on your phone. Yeah, there was a case in Canada, I want to say maybe two years ago, Maybe the first one I'm aware of were Fitbit data. I've got a Fitbit. So the mm-hmm. first Fitbit data was introduced in a case. To, it was a personal injury case to sort of show this is how active my life was before this injury. Mm-hmm. And this is how inactive I am now. And that was all just from wearable Fitbit data information. I trick mine all the time because every time my blood pressure goes up, it swears I'm working out. And I close my exercise <laughs> ring and all I am is agitated. <laughs> I'm sitting at my desk all day just getting agitated. Or put it on the dog's collar it's and like, let them yeah, run exactly. around and get your steps. It's like yeah. your workout's complete. Yeah. Like I have it stood up in three hours. <laughs> but um, the other thing that people often ask me about, and I'm not sure – whether this is something that, that you guys get into is they are worried about something in their car mm-hmm. being tracked or followed. And the first thing we look at is the phone because the phone is usually in the car while they're driving around. So right. We're saying, well, you know, it may not be a device on your phone. They've just got the location services or right. or something on your phone. But what about trackers and, and the GPS in the, in the cars? Is that something that you guys download or look at their information we will occasionally look at data that's been pulled down. That vehicle forensics is sort of a separate area. And, and when I say that, I'm talking about not a PI has stuck a GPS on your, your car. You know, that's a pretty easy thing to, to see and figure out. I'm talking more about what are called the infotainment sort of systems, these complicated systems on these um, devices or on these uh, cars. One thing to think about is if you are have your Bluetooth and it's synced to your, your car, a lot of the newer ones will sync your contact list. And so if you've got a contact in there you don't want someone to see, uh, that might be an issue and something that would, would go on there. Most cars do have some sort of GPS embedded now in these systems. Uh, OnStar, any car that has OnStar, we have had clients who wanted their OnStar just completely disabled. The car I have now, I bought secondhand, and I'm still getting the, the vehicle reports forwarded to me about, well, I didn't know they were tracking my tire pressure, you know, that type of thing. So... Those potentially are a treasure trove. There are fewer people out there who do that type of work. But certainly at the law enforcement schools that I teach at, vehicle forensics is also taught there. And it is a a thing to be aware of. And it may be leaving imprints on your your phone as well. Think about the, the rental car that you've now returned. And the address of that car is now in your phone because you've synced those two things. And you've potentially put your contact list and so forth on that car as well if you're not sort of careful about what you're doing. So that that is an issue. Well, and more and more of the cars are rolling out with Apple Play or mm-hmm. CarPlay yeah. these days, too. And how much is actually sort of getting stored on the car's computer when you have that activated? That is a good question. 
I don't know the answer to that. We've got Apple Play on one of our cars, and I don't um, don't actually use it all that much. I will tell you, we have been asked to look at the Apple Watches, sort of as an analogy to that. And on the Apple Watches, at least, what we found is the data, everything. If you've got your Apple Watch synced to a phone, it all kind of goes back to the iPhones, iPads. Pretty much all the data that's on that Apple Watch is going to be synced to a device. There's not really much point in looking at the Apple Watch because everything has been synced to the iPhone. I think it's probably similar for the CarPlay or the Apple Play, but I don't know that for sure because we haven't done one of those yet. So it's not a situation. You really do go back to the device. So you can't really take in the watch and say, well, I got the watch. I don't have the phone, but right. I've got the watch or I've got the car. <laughs> yeah. With the car on, on the Apple, on the Apple, on the Androids, we mm-hmm. have successfully, you know, Android phone or uh, watches will store quite a bit of information. And we have done some forensics on several Android watches. And they work. Yep. yep. Now, the uh, Androids that people bring in, do you find, I mean, just, we're not doing a commercial here, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it, are people more vulnerable to have their Androids used against them than they are their Apple products? Generally speaking, yes. And it has a little less to do with the device itself, you know, the Samsung being better than the Apple. It has more to do with the control that those entities exercise over their app stores. So the Google Play or the Android app stores, we have found at least, there is more capacity for those more malicious applications to be allowed for download, legitimate download on the the Google store or the Android store than on the Apple app store. While if you were to Google it and see oh, you know, Apple. there was this one bad app that was uploaded this one time kind of thing. As a general rule, Apple has much more control or at least exercises more control over the apps that you're allowed to download on the Apple Store, which is where the whole jailbreaking things come in, right? So if the kids see an app they want and Apple won't let them download it, they jailbreak their device and then get it. So short-sighted. Right. Well, If someone were listening to this and decided, okay, I'm not going to do this myself, I know you've talked about the fact that, generally speaking, you're going to ask them if they're they're working through an attorney. But we know this happens both ways. They either come to me and and I'll suggest that, you know, we need to contact you or they're going to reach out to you. But if they want to reach out with you, and maybe it's not a legal matter, they really are just trying to find some information that they've, they've lost on their computer, where could they find you? We have a website. It is in the process of being updated. It's a, there is a legacy WordPress site out there, but it's www.reliance, R-E-L-I-A-N-C-E, forensics, plural, so F-O-R-E-N-S-I-C-S dot com. We have a main line. We're open five days a week, eight to five, nine eight zero three three five zero seven. One zero, and just ask to speak with an examiner and, and someone can at least do an initial consultation. Well, we appreciate you coming because this is just getting to be a bigger and bigger deal in yeah. everyone's life. Yeah, we keep getting busier sometimes whether we want to be or not. But mm-hmm. yeah, we keep getting busier. So well, it's thank a good you. problem to have. And you found a way to be a lawyer and not practice law. So. Yeah, it's like the dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> For most people, yeah. I think it is, unfortunately. Yeah. But it was great to have you here. Thanks, Clark. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. So there you have it, another neighborhood of Splitsville explored. There's still so much to learn here, so I hope you'll tune in to the next episode. While Splitsville is not a fun place to be, thankfully it is full of helpful people, valuable resources, and sound advice if you know where to look. See you next time. The insights and views presented in Welcome to Splitsville are for general information purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice for any individual case or situation. Nor does tuning into this podcast constitute an attorney-client relationship of any kind. If you're ready for compassionate and reliable legal guidance on your journey, contact Lee Sellers and her team at www.touchstonefamilylaw.com.